Okay, people, tomorrow morning, 10 a.m., Santa's coming to town. Santa! Oh, my God! Santa here? I know him. I know him. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Seismic Cinema. I am Buddy the Rifter, aka James. Tonight we have got Colin, who has a screen name of Mr. Now. We'll get into that later. And we welcome our special guest tonight. I say tonight because it's eight, nine o'clock in Scotland. We have Brian. Hi, Brian. How's it going, gentlemen? Yeah, all good here. I'm very good. good. Very good. James, I'm you t- excited you- to come on. James, you time traveling. It's only quarter past eight. You round, rounding up. <laughs> so that's, I'm just that, I'm just just that actually that we start at nine o'clock. <laughs> I've been watching Doctor Who recently, so it's maybe um, that. Aye, so we are Seismic Cinema. You can find us on Twitter, Threads, YouTube, TikTok, and probably if any other social it's out there. Um, so. If you could like, subscribe to the many platforms that you have, we would be very, very grateful on that. Um, we're sitting at 114 subscribers now on YouTube, so we have moved up one away from that 13 number, so that's all good. Um, so keep it up, guys. Just try and help us grow the channel. As I said, folks, we've got Brian, who is our special guest tonight. So I'm going to give a wee kind of let Brian take on a little bit of his background and where you can find Brian and his podcast and stuff. So... Brian, take it away. Absolutely. Again, thanks for having me on. I mean, we've we've crossed paths multiple times uh, at my time with Bleach Bros. Um, so I w- I'm the former host or host and co-host of uh, Bleach Bros podcast. Um, did that with my buddy Jake for a little over two years, two and a half years, something like that. Um, we we did a lot of talking about movies, about life, about manhood. Uh, comedy, a lot of that sort of stuff. Uh, but it was just time for us to kind of hang up the microphones with that as we were moving different ways creatively. So um, Jake and I are still great friends. Uh, spoke with him this morning, actually. So things are still uh, going great there. But um, I have my own project. Uh, I have unfiltered discussions. And this is a long form podcast, uh, interview podcast, where I bring people on and I talk about things that they want to talk about. So it's unfiltered as in there's no there's no topic that's that's off limits. Uh, we've talked about things that you know have to do with trauma or paranormal, um, some great stories uh, that people have, uh, and just share that that way. So uh, my podcast releases every Monday, and uh, it's it's uh, in the middle of the second season right now. Nice one. All right, so be sure to check out Brian's podcast, Unfiltered Discussions, and I'll be looking forward to tuning in, Brian, as. Colin will do as well, I'm sure. Looking forward to it. Good, good. Right, so a wee recap then of the the previous episodes from Seismic Cinema slash Seismic Soccer. Um, So the last episode that we released was Seismic Soccer 3. The one before that was Big Trouble in Little China. Uh, That review um, done pretty well. And before that, it was, well, just after that rather, was the 100th episode that we had. It was an epic two hour well over two hours long of the star wars sequels podcast um so if you haven't checked them out folks get them checked out because they are class um tonight's episode we are going to as you're already aware from the little banner at the bottom we are going to be talking about the 2003 movie elf and it is the start of our festive season so to give a wee introduction to Elf then, a wee synopsis, which I can't believe, by the way, it's 20 years old. Mm-hmm. I just found that out just at the, at maybe a month ago or so. That makes me feel old. <laughs> really, really old. Um, so, synopsis of the film, the buddy of the Elf is transported to the North Pole by accident and he is raised by Elves. He knows he's different but doesn't know why, and finds out he's a human and goes to New York City to find his real father. Eventually, his dad tries to strike a relationship with Buddy, but things go from bad to worse very, very quickly. Um, so, a wee bit of background about the film then. The director, do you know who the director was, Colin? Favreau. Yeah, Favreau. Um, yeah. I knew that, and then I forgot it, and then I remembered again. 
So, John uh, Favreau, yep, who we know as Monica's boyfriend from Friends. He doesn't, he doesn't miss Favreau, does he? <laughs> <laughs> Um, a wee joke there. Obviously, he's known from a lot more than that, um, especially in the Star Wars slash Marvel universe. Um, he actually wrote it as well with David Berenbaum, Warner Brothers Studios and New Line Cinema were the ones who took it on. And the film stars Will Ferrell, James Caan, Bob New Newhart, Zoe Deschanel, Mary Steinberger, and our probably one of our favourite Game of Thrones characters. Peter Dinklage. Yeah. Yeah. So it's quite a, a star studied cast, I'd say. Uh, there's a lot more cast members certainly there, but um, those are the ones I could be bothered writing down. So the budget for the film was 33 million. It grossed 227 million, which was a, a profit of 194 million. So it's safe to say, folks, that it did quite well. Blockbuster status for sure. Yeah, I don't even remember it coming out, to be honest with you. In 2003, I was 18, and I was probably too busy getting drunk at that point to really care about Christmas films. So it wasn't probably until I, years later till I watched it in DVD, really. Go through the kind of structure then. So a series of questions for you, um, and we can, can I just chat about them. So I'll ask yourself, Brian, because you're the, you are the guest. So... Can you remember when you first watched the film, when you first seen it? Yeah, I, 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 like you, was probably too busy rinsing my liver to care about a Christmas film in 2003. Um, <laughs> so I was probably maybe 2005, 2006 area when, when my daughter was old enough to kind of comprehend Christmas movies when I first watched it. And it was one of those ones that Will Ferrell had already moved on to other films, uh, old school and and uh, potentially Wedding Crashers, if that was coming out right around that time, um, where I had I had found him as as a film star around that time. Uh, I know I knew Will Ferrell as a as a Saturday Night Live cast member, but I didn't realize that he was actually making a transition into into film. And John Favreau, I knew him from Swingers, so that was back in. Uh, the er, the mid '90s, I guess, with with him and Vince Vaughn. So that's kind of the premise of of how I found this film. Of course, like you said, great cast. Uh, one, once I watched it, it hit every single button that I was looking for from a Christmas movie. So I I watched it probably because my daughter was young enough or old enough to to realize what it was, and I think I probably loved it a lot more than she did. What about yourself, Colin? Honestly, I don't really remember when I first watched it, but I do have the DVD, so I obviously either bought the DVD and then fell in love with it, or maybe I did see it in the cinema. I don't really remember, but it is one that I, I watch every Christmas uh, period, sometimes twice, within the kind of holiday season as well. Uh, it's funny you, you mentioned, Brian, about Will Ferrell in terms of like transition from saturday night live into into film now i don't really remember will ferrell being famous for this film and you said that you said wedding crashers old school and there's another one as well maybe anchorman just came just after that or there they're about anyway so I, really i kind of recognize him more from the films than elf but obviously elf is a is a massive film um and it's a a massive fit for a lot of people. Uh, for me, as I said, I was in, I was eighteen years old. Didn't really care much about Christmas films really at that point. But as you get older, you start to kind of get a wee bit more. I don't know into them is the right phrase, but certainly um, you become more appreciative of the films. Yeah, um, I think, and really, I can say I've I've seen this film. Um, about three or four times. So, Colin, yeah, yeah, not as much. Those, as you are, guys. Rookie, those are those are rookie numbers. Those uh, are rookie uh, numbers. I'm you gonna, gonna pump I'm, those suckers up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to go into it later on, but I really didn't really really rate the film. To be fair, at, at, at the start. Um, so as I've got older, I've uh, I say I've been rewatching it for the pod. I've probably actually appreciated it a wee bit more. Obviously, I think the, the film is it's it's fun packed all the way through. 
Yeah. Um, and I'm going to ask you to pick maybe one or two of your favourite scenes from the film um, to kind of start us off then. So um, I'll go in reverse order this time. So Colin, what is your kind of favourite scenes from I've, the film? I've got them because the, I watched this over last night and this morning. I actually watched it with my stepson who's nine and it was his first time watching it. And I'm discovering that pure joy of just watching a, a film you love through someone else's eyes as well, which is really nice. Um, so I've decided uh, my, the best part in the whole film for me is the first time he gets knocked over by a taxi when he's trying to cross the road and it just takes him right out of the game. I just every time I see that, every time I see that, but I just laugh so much. Um, can I pick three bits? No, two. Two's fine. Two's fine. No, okay, um, then you can steal somebody else's. So uh, I know that's why. That's why I decided not to. <laughs> um, going back to my screen name, I just love when Mister Narwhal pops out the water and goes. I hope you found your dad. Uh, <laughs> it's like the voice of you, but there's a lot of other. I hope there's, there's a lot of other um, bits as well, but a lot of other bits aye. as well. But I'll I'll bring them up later if nobody mentions them. I I've um, purposely didn't go any through any trivia at the start, so we can maybe kind of put them in as we go through the film. So, um, Brian, up yourself. I I like when uh, when Buddy walks in on Zoe Deschanel in in the shower and she starts singing. And he starts pairing with her singing. Um, what I what I found pretty interesting about that that scene is that uh, apparently that wasn't scripted. So John Favre, Favreau found out that Zoe that Zoe Deschanel can sing and just added it in at that point. Um, but another another part that I just I laugh every time I see it was when um, when Buddy is trying to do something nice for his new family and he ends up making them lunch. And the lunch is spaghetti noodles with syrup. And that was also the same thing for breakfast. And, you know, the, just the look on their face, the dumbfoundedness of them being able to watch it. That That's also something that I just think is heartwarming, but it also illustrates the mindset of Buddy, which is very much a childlike mind. And then, of course, then you have the family dynamic of, of understanding that he's part of the family, but also not part of the family. So I kind of like that, too. Yeah. That's quite good because my favorite my, my favorite scene has to came up with it. So mine um is probably the bit where he guzzles the the big bit the big uh, bottle of juice. And it's that scene obviously where he's eating the, the spaghetti and maple syrup and he just guzzles it and then that big massive burp that comes out and it's mm -hmm. it's so my, my name, Buddy the Rifter. I don't know, we call in Glasgow anyway. I don't know if you call him Colin, but we call burps riffs. So Buddy the Rifter sounded a bit good rather than Buddy the Drifter. Um, so that scene was just funny because like Buddy, I can um, burp like that. Um, so after a good... Oh. Not, not right now. Uh, I need to have a, a good can of Iron Brew first. <laughs> Busy drinks. Um, then I've, I can do I've it. Never, I've never heard that term before, by the way. Must not, not have made it over to the to the west coast you must be too posh then for it mate aye <laughs> um, so what, I, what I can do then what I can do is if you want to hear me burp like Buddy the Elf then we can sign up for the Patreon service <laughs> you can do that um, so that's probably the, I guess that's my favourite scene probably um, another one as well that I've noted down um, is the the Jack in the Box scene yeah, <laughs> he's, he's just gonna wind them up. He's testing them when he gets them motivated to test them. He's shit at um, building them. So he's you know he's do 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 do. He goes straight to and it just comes up and he shits himself. So that's uh, that was uh, a funny scene as well because you for the viewer you probably expected to happen anyway, um, and then he didn't. So I think it's was... the fact that they did it twice and it was funny, but they did it a third time and it was still funny. So kind of landed. Oh, well, definitely. Fun fact on that particular scene that wasn't scripted either. So <laughs> the 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 part of him going through and testing the Jack in the Boxes was scripted, but his reactions were his, were Will Ferrell's <laughs> actual reactions. His reactions weren't scripted. So that's also pretty funny too when you start looking. I think what 
what Will Ferrell was probably trying to do is saying, okay, how many turns can I take on this Jack in the box before it's done? But that final one where the Jack in the box pops out that, that Will Ferrell's reaction on that is completely pure. I love that. I love that the directors can go down that road um, of just getting the actors natural reactions to things. Um, but just the thing that comes to my mind is another Christmas movie actually, uh, Die Hard, when Hans Gruber, Alan Rickman, falls off the building. Yeah. Um, he didn't know that he was going to be falling at that point, and it, that that's that infamous that famous scene rather um iconic one where he's the watches come off his wrist and it's that kind of holy shit moment like that's uh-huh. how he a reaction because he's falling um so i do like the that aspect that the the directors can kind of test the boundaries with the actors well like, Ferrell is, well well Ferrell is probably well one of my favorite comedic actors like this and anchorman and Step Brothers and daddy's home is another personal favorite of mine um yeah genius i don't think i've seen daddy so much actually great film no it, it hits extra differently now that i've got stepkids um yeah tearjerker uh, <laughs> right okay then um well obviously there's a lot more scenes in that we can go back to them shortly but um what about your favorite quotes because they could maybe match in with the scenes anyway, so we can maybe talk about the scenes and the quotes at the same time then. So, favourite quotes, and this time I'll go with yourself, Brian. So, is there any quotes that stand out that, you know, you, do you quote them, like, you know, yeah. every day, but you you would know. Well, every, every time I'm at work, I sit there and I and I, I mumble under my breath, you sit on a throne of lies. <laughs> and, and I just think that that's, you know, that wasn't what I find funny is, is that that wasn't scripted either. Like that wasn't in the script, but that was part of that. Will Ferrell just breaking into the character that, that said that. And the, the, the setup for the scene is that he finds out that the mall Santa isn't real. And, you know, now he's, he's yelling at Santa, you sit on a throne of lies. I think that that one's awesome. I use that one frequently. Yeah, that's, that's one I've got written down as well. You sit in a throne of lies. So, very good. Um, Colin? How many am I allowed this time? Well, go with one. We'll, we'll go back round. We'll go back round. Okay. Don't worry. Okay. Um, I'd probably go for... Is Buddy the Elf? What's your favourite colour? <laughs> Just... Yeah, 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 that's right. <laughs> and, uh... Anytime you answer the phone or, like... We've got an intercom at my flat, and uh, it's really tempting to do that. I've said to my stepson who was watching it, I said, because he always answers the door when it goes, so I said, you need to start saying that when you answer the door. <laughs> that was good. Um, that whole scene in there as well with the whole, when Miles, isn't it his name is, the Peter Drinkley's uh, character? Miles Finch. Yeah. Miles Finch, uh, so that whole scene's good. We can talk about that shortly. Um my favorite, well, not one of my favorite quotes is um, the bit where he's he's, he's writing his he's leaving, leaving letter in the extra sketch, and he's like, I'm sorry I've ruined your lives, and then I, sh- and I crammed the living cookies in the VCR. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so it's like <laughs> back in the day when you had a, a, a VCR, putting stuff inside that would be an absolute nightmare. So and it, at that point, it could be a life ruiner, could ruin lives. So that was what I went to kiss stuck stuck to me. I'll, I'll go again second, and then you'll go back around again. Okay. So don't eat yellow snow. It's also a good one. I know that one. So uh, I was quite a, a few good ones. I think you could do a whole podcast just on the quotes in this film, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, when, you, yeah. when you think about it, is it my turn? Go, on, you turn. You go, you go. Right. You already mentioned it. We're coming back to the scene, but um, call me an elf one more time. <laughs> He's an angry elf. Uh, he goes, uh, um, yeah. you must be a self call elf. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just the just the little the little things that are within the quotes just make it so funny. I know it's like he's 
he's talking to people that aren't even really listening to him. He must be a South Pole elf. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, that, that was good. And he, he says, call me an elf one more time. And he gets him, drop kicks him. <laughs> and then he's got him in a headlock and he goes, call me an elf one more time. <laughs> it shows Peter Dinklage's range as well because as Tyrion, most of the time he's just really lovable and witty, but when he's Miles, he's he's pretty angry and uh, not the nicest of guys. I know, that's true. He was also good in uh, Infinity War as well, wasn't he? Hmm. <laughs> when he was giant. The giant, uh, yeah. Indeed. All right, Brian, any more? You want to... Yeah, probably the other one that I like is uh, when Will Ferrell sees Santa in the mall. Uh, I, and he yells out Santa and it's just it's it's pure in a sense that I feel like well Will Ferrell put his mindset as that of a kid and for us particularly as adults watching this film we we can see Will Ferrell and and in this particular movie you know we're we're relatively well we're not all three of us are older than what he was at the time but probably when we first saw it we were right around Will Ferrell's age and we don't see mall Santas that way. You know, we see, Oh, well, look, there's a Renaissance Santa or whatever we want to call him. But, um, but yeah, it was just, it was funny in a sense where it was just purely innocent. And then of course it ties back around to that. You sit on a throne of lies situation where he finds out that it's fake. And I think that there's a lot of uh, growth that comes from that because when we, when we think about our own Christmas experience, you know, at what point did we stop believing in Santa or, question if santa's real and at this point buddy is completely pure and everything around him is kind of influencing that thought process now so i i like that part of it yeah man it's uh the film i think it brings a range of emotion as well like i said probably my initial reaction to this film would be that it was overrated i don't think that anymore actually because I, I remember like you would be on Facebook and it'd be elf, elf, I'm watching elf, elf's the best film, elf is this, elf is that. And I'm going, is there something wrong with me then? Because like everyone loves this film. You're and a South Pole elf. I'm a South Pole elf, yeah. Probably. So I'm like, there's nothing wrong with me here. I like I, I need to give it another go. Um and I gave it another go. And yeah, man, I say uh, I, I enjoyed it. Probably a lot, more, a lot, definitely a lot more than I did before. Um, as as I was saying, it brings a lot of emotion. It goes from happy to sad, back to happy again, and it's just it, it's it's very well done. I think um, there's a lot of scenes in it that the scene where he, he obviously runs away and he, and he's uh, his his wee brother, his, his younger brother actually, kind of goes to his dad in the boardroom, and it's like buddy's running away, and at this point, James can. His, his real dad is like he's such a, a workaholic he's 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 the cynical businessman and it's like he doesn't really care about his family that's quite evidence in the film when he's got no time for his son anyway but when he comes into the boardroom and his son's like everybody really needs your help and at that moment he's he knows how important this pitch is and it's like this guy's giving him a hard time i can't remember the guy's name now actually um, who he's pitching to, but certainly he's like, you better do this pitch. I flew hundreds of miles to to to, see, to hear this. If you don't give the pitch, you're fired. And at that moment, it's like, well, you know what? Screw you. I'm going with my family. And it was nice to see that because it's like that kind of turn from being on the naughty list as he was, and now on the, on the, the good list. So that was a nice wee moment. I don't know what you thought about that. I'll go with Brian first. No, I thought that that was a really cool moment. Um, you know, the, these films, I, I think that Buddy the Elf is is really centered around um, the the story of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer because Rudolph was kind of made fun of. Uh, he also ran away. It had a lot of the same elements of that, but it also had a lot of the same uh, elements from a lot of the claymation style Christmas films that we saw like Frosty the Snowman and Santa Claus is coming to town. So it brought that in. And with all of those stories, there's always a transformation. And in this story, James Kahn's character had to be the one to transform in order to more or less save Christmas. And I really enjoyed the emphasis on that. I like the fact that James Kahn made the decision 
but it was also a nice image, kind of like in the, in the sense of uh, Ebenezer Scrooge, where he softens his stance on Christmas, and it becomes a lot more um, the meaning of the season and a lot more the Christmas spirit. So, yeah, I really enjoyed that part of it. Aye, and it's at, at the end as well. We'll get to that point, but at the end as well, that is um, the 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 Santa sleigh doesn't actually fly in the air until James can actually sings the song because that was like the moment that changed everything because he's 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 a believer now and that was nice. Um, before I go on uh, into the next wee bit, I want you to you know try and rack your brains a little bit. And do you remember the three rules? The three, not really, not really the rules, but the code of the elves. Do you remember them? Oh, yeah, that's a good piece of trivia there. Um, I don't, to be honest with jumping, you. It's not, it's not jumping out at me. I must admit. You call if you gave a, I'm telling you, if, if you gave. Me, if you gave one, then I might get the other right, okay, two. Good, the a good teach, it's a good teaching technique, James. I'll do some scaffolding then. So we'll do the first one would be treat every day like Christmas. Yes, I remember that one. Um, <laughs> I feel like as soon as you say them all, I'll be like, oh, that's really obvious. Yeah, same thing. Um, all right, so that's that. I'm scrapping nah, this point. You've, nah. you've Right, okay. So the second I hear them, though. is there's room for everyone on the nice list, even yes. you, Colin. Of course. And you must on the third one. You must on the third one. It's critical at the end of the film. Oh. What happens at the end of the film? What does Zoe de Chanel do? She sings. Yes. Sing, Sing loud for all to hear. The best way to spread okay, Christmas cheer. Yeah. The best yeah. way to spread Christmas cheer is, is singing loud for all to hear. There you go. Actually, the oh. message message of the film, isn't it? Yeah. So I'll James, get I didn't get a. You 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 skipped me on that bit. It was a. I had some. <laughs> no, I had some stuff I wanted to say about the the James Can character. Okay. So if, 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 no, if this is the time to share it, I don't know. Okay, so Colin. What's your opinions and, and comments on J the James Can <laughs> character? <laughs> no, the, the the reason why I went back the reason why I went back to it is it's it's actually one of my favorite parts of the whole film. I think the scenes with Buddy are just like wacky and mental, but I think the scenes with the family kind of level it out a wee bit and it kind of slows it down and makes it a wee bit more normal. And I just loved seeing his development because at first he was totally against Buddy, then he agreed to take him to work, and then. You could just kind of see him unraveling slowly as the film went on, and I do love that scene where he chose to go and find Buddy and like support his son. And I think that scene's more impactful the older you get when you're trying to balance like your workload, particularly around this time of year with family time. And uh, that really struck a chord with me when he made the decision to leave the meeting for his son. Uh, also, there's another scene I really like to see the bit at the end you were talking about when. You know the news reporter. She was interviewing. I can't remember who she was interviewing, but she was kind of like joking about the elves and Santa Claus. But then they read out what she wanted for Christmas, like when she was younger or something. And then you could see her like believing as well. I thought that was another good bit. So yeah, that was a that was the brother. The brother grabbed Santa's book and read mm -hmm. off her Christmas yeah. list. It was like yeah. to be engaged to her boyfriend or something. Uh, or so like, it was her boyfriend needs to stop dragging, dragging, dragging his, his feet. Commit already. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so your, your take on that whole news report scene is different from mine. But what I remember from that is the, the so she's trying to get the the people around to try and get, because they've all had an eyewitness account of Santa being in Central Park. And she's interviewing this guy. And he's like, hey, man, I love you, man. You're, he, he, she keeps asking him serious questions. And he's like, I love your, your pretty eyes. I, I love your eyes. Yeah, <laughs> such just, a creeper. He just, he just comes up, you're creepy. But she's like, not even taking any notice of it. And he's just like, he's not give, giving any sort of input to Santa being in Santa at the Central Park. So I found that bit quite funny. Probably a bit funnier than most people do. But it was just, 
for me it was a bit funny. But I did. Uh, I, I loved the bit when they announced. I can't remember. Was it sen- the Central Park Rangers? Is that what they were called? Aye. Yes. I, I, I yes. Just, see when they announced it was the Central Park, where they just made them sound so like intimidating. As they were dark and ominous. The hospital, the yeah. hospital the apocalypse, isn't it? It was like they just um, and then even Santa goes, "Oh no, the New York Rain, no the the Central Park Rangers." <laughs> so I, uh, so he said previously it seems as well. Do you know what I mean? So that was good. Um, well, and their motive too to be so. Uh, villainous was the fact that they were on the naughty list, which is what I really enjoyed too. Because it was just why, why would, why would it matter? But all of a sudden, Santa comes out and says, "Oh, they were on the naughty list." And now you have the backstory to these, you know, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. If you want to look at it that way, but yeah, it was pretty good. Yeah, um, a bit of trivia um, I read as well was that James Can and Will Ferrell didn't get on at all during the oh. film. They didn't get on. Um, that works quite well for the characters, then, doesn't it? <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, it's just, uh, definitely worked out better for the best. I actually quite, I actually like James Cannon in this film. It kind of moves on to my next kind of question, me, but and I'm kind of he, he passed away, didn't man. he, within the last couple of years, didn't he? he had to I die. I obviously know more from The Godfather rather than Elf, but um, I can't really remember, remember what else he's in. Um, James Cannon. Oh, well, come to me, but the Godfather type comes to me. He plays Sonny, um, Sonny Corleone in the Godfather. Um, have you seen he that? Colin? A... No, no comment. He he was in a movie too, called too uh, long. called The Stepmother, I think, with Susan Sarandon and Julia Roberts, stepmom, maybe, right? Where Susan Sarandon's the ex wife and Julia Roberts is the new wife, and it's their it's you know. The dynamic there that it's a good movie too kind of sad at the end but um but yeah he's been in he's been in quite a bit of film um i mean obviously he won't be in any more film which is disappointing but uh but yeah great actor but their their dynamic will ferrell and james conn kind of reminds me of tommy lee jones and jim carrey in uh batman was it batman forever uh, jim carrey was the riddler and he was just obnoxious and um you know, Tommy Lee Jones and Jim Carrey don't like each other in real life because of that role. Um, I think that, and funny, funny fact, actually, and I, I hope this doesn't spoil anything that you have on the agenda, but the the film was actually written in mind for Jim Carrey. So I just think that it's, it's quite funny that, that Will Ferrell and James Caan kind of had that dynamic given what was in Jim Carrey's past. I didn't know he was in, in line for that at all, actually. Um, so that's interesting here. I'm, yeah, I'm both. glad it was well. I'm glad it was well, Ferrell. Me too. Both both he and uh, Chris Farley were identified for the role. Chris Farley passed away beforehand. I think the movie took, I want to say the movie took six or seven years in development uh, to go from the original script into what it was. But um, but I think that Will Ferrell's perfect for it. I, I could see Chris Farley doing it. I just think that it would have probably been either a little bit more raunchy or probably kind of dark um, in order for that that to work. But for what will for what will Farrell put out? I think it was ideal. No, it's perfect. I think um, it was just like you just know from Will Ferrell what you're getting. It's just comedy line, laugh after laugh with Will Ferrell. So can't really complain in that regard. I, I'm going back to James Caan for a second. I gave him a massive disservice. He was in Misery, um, and uh, that's oh, a great, yeah. great movie with Kathy Bates. That was filmed actually 10 miles away from where I live. Oh, perfect. they they erected the house for misery, and uh, the scene where he crashes is actually a road up to Lake Tahoe, which is uh, which is that's how I would go to Lake Tahoe. So it's 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 kind of a uh, a local film for us here, if if you want to call it that. But yeah, Kathy, uh, Kathy Bates was great in that one. Oh, she was. I don't know if she won an Oscar for that or not, I can't remember. She should have. Uh, if she didn't, have you seen that film, Colin? No comment. There's a, <laughs> there's, there's a there's a running joke, Brian. That I've not seen a lot of things, but I have actually seen a lot of things over the course of doing the podcast. It's always the things I haven't seen that people ask about. Um, I was going to mention, see the mum in the film. Yes. Who, who plays her again? Mary yeah. Steen Steenbergen yeah. Steenberger. Yeah, Mary Steenberger. Another, 
another great film she's in i don't know if you've seen it um last vegas with morgan freeman oh yeah and, uh, yeah i love uh, that film well fun fact she was also the mom and stepbrothers yeah Sure. And right. she was uh, uh, Doc Brown's wife in Back to the Future Three. Ah, so she was. Yeah. So I'll come to it now. But Thanks. Colin, I don't expect you to watch any of those films. So if you haven't seen them, that's perfectly fine. I think we should do a Back to the Future podcast. So that'd be fun. Well, sign me up for that one. That would be a great, <laughs> great one. I could talk it's about that quick. all day. We'll do that in twenty four. And have it at least on Back to the Future Day. Yeah. Uh, right. Okay. So, moving on then to favorite characters. Um, so, I quite a few characters in, in here. We could talk about them all day. I know we could, but obviously, Buddy the Elf would be high up there. Um, obviously. But Brian, is there any other character that may stand it stands out to you? You know, it had a kind of connection to you, or you just found them kind of really funny. Yeah, actually, um, the the person that I really enjoyed being in the film, there's actually two people, um, and it's only for coincidence, I think, or for for irony, I guess. Um, you had Ed Asner cast as Santa Claus, and Ed Asner was famous for starring in the Mary Tyler Moore show, uh, which came out, you know, a long time ago. But you also had Papa, or you had Papa Elf um, cast as Bob Newhart. Um, so Bob Newhart and Mary Tyler Moore kind of had this you know, going back and forth uh, as far as, I don't, I don't remember if they actually crossed over, but the two shows were very similar. So to have Ed Asner as Santa Claus, and then of course, Bob Newhart as Papa Elf, I thought was just a really good homage to previous, ge previous generations comedy, if you will. Um, and I think that the film did a lot, did did very well in paying homage to a lot of different things, but I thought that that was just unique in a sense that those two came from comedy TV sitcoms uh, here in the U S back in that day. But the fact that they were both on screen in, in this project, I just found that to be ironic and, and pretty cool. Excellent, man. What yourself, Colin? Mr. Narwhal. No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> I, I seen that came to mind. I can't remember what the characters were called, but the the two like head writers that work under um, Walter Hobbs. That's James Cairn's character's oh, name. Yeah. Is. Before you before you um, uh, go on, I need to say something. That is Kyle Gas from Tenacious D, mm -hmm. a, a, a brilliant band. The Jack Black. Which one? Which which of the two guys? He's the bald one. Bald one. The bald one. Yeah. With the with the facial hair. Sorry, yeah, I, I, I just think it's funny that, like, as they point out in the film, they're the writers for the company, and it's like their big idea is to bring in another writer, and they're just like Miles Finch. <laughs> I just thought that was quite funny. Um, not my favorite characters. I just thought that bit was funny. Um, I don't. I don't really know who. Oh, I like the the guy who's like the manager of the shop, and just yeah, how angry I... he gets the whole time. And I like the wee brother. I think it was quite. I quite like the bond that they forged and how he quite quickly. Oh, he came to respect him after that other great scene with the snowballs. Oh, uh, it's good. I've got that written down as well. Was, um, yeah, the, the snowballs were the only, from what I understand, were the only CGI in this film. So everything else was shot either on site or done with some sort of filming. So, so even when Will Ferrell was like sitting on Papa Elf's lap and you see like the size dis disparity between the two, that was done with a trick of the camera. That wasn't necessarily CGI, but my understanding is the only CGI that happened on this film was the snowball fight. It's classic. I wish I could throw a snowball like that. Me too. <laughs> I'm, laughing. I'm just laughing at the bit when he's in the shower and he's just like pouring the water towards himself. <laughs> Aye. Um, my favorite character. Um, I like the little brother, younger brother, um, Colin as well. I think it's a nice relationship because it, I think it, in a in a sense, he's never had. Well, it seems to be anyway that he's never really had his dad there because he's always put work as his first priority. 
and now we get somebody who's came in out of nowhere and he's just but he's just so nice to, to, all the time at the start his, his younger brothers a wee bit more kind of dismissive of him a wee bit but then starts to kind of for, forge a bond with him like you say Colin and it's, it's nice to see not my favourite characters to a degree but certainly it's it was nice to that that happened favourite character I don't know, man. Um, I think Zoe Deschanel is uh, very important to the to the film. You know, she brings out the the not the, the goodness in Buddy, but certainly the he, he, he there's love there to give more love, and he he, he recognises that. I'm and I in love, that. and I don't care who knows it. <laughs> 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 so again, she's very you know critical to the role, and she played. Played that part brilliantly, and I didn't know until recently that it was her singing as well. Mm-hmm. Like that was like her voice is is beautiful, isn't it? Like, um, so very good, very nice singing voice. So I liked her it's character. Weird. It's it's weird how like a lot of people didn't even realize that was her because like she looks totally different with the blonde hair compared to the usual dark hair. Aye. Yeah, a lot of people thought she was Katy Perry. I was just going to say those, that. those two look very similar. I was just going to say that because, um, yeah, they do look quite similar. I thought it was Katy, Katy Perry at first. Um, I'm not ashamed to say I did what used to watch New Girl a bit back in the day. Jess from New Girl. Who's that girl? <laughs> I only know I only know that because I looked up the Wikipedia, the IMDb. So that's a, that's something I've not seen, Colin. So there you go. Um, that's what I knew her from. Originally before Elf, probably. Yeah, well, I know from Elf, I think. Like I say, I've Elf. got a point on her character. I was hoping it would come up. Was a what was it? Maybe she just was attracted to Buddy, but like, what was it that made her like fall in love with this total man child who thought he was an Elf? It was an interesting choice. You know, there's actually part of the storyline that that portion was taken from. Uh, and it was influenced a lot from a Tom Hanks film called Big. I don't know if you guys have seen Big. But basically in that film, Tom Hanks's character makes a wish at a uh, psychic machine thing. I forget what it is. And he wishes that he would become big because he was tired of being treated like a child. And he ends up becoming Tom Hanks. Uh, overnight scares his mom. The whole works. Long story short, there was a love story that happened in Big where he was kind of dating a coworker and all that sort of stuff. And I think a lot of that storyline with, with Zoe Deschanel and Will Ferrell was taken from that because it has a lot of that feel from it where you have a man child, you have a boy who's shaped like a man um, falling in love with kind of a coworker in, in a sense. I mean, he's not working per se for the Macy's imitation store but you know you have a lot of that storyline there and i think a lot of that is just you know because it's been done before it's easy to do it again kind of thing in hollywood you know yeah that um fortune teller machine was called zoltar speaks yes yeah it's a great film that call you seen that yes (laughs) (laughs) although um i've just thought of another film i'd love to review uh honey i shrunk the kids Oh, aye. Great movie. Way to start uh, discussing the, the plans for the new year, Colin, maybe all these films we're coming up with. Yeah, you the original you Ant-Man mean? franchise. Okay, well, peace out. Oh, and by the way, I wouldn't be a good host if I didn't say the motto, Colin. So we are Psychic Cinema, and we believe in the power of escapism. So we escape into our pods and enter our realm. There you go, something new, Colin. Right, okay, so... Like I'm kind of nearly wrapping up now. What was your take then on the the final scenes of the film? Of course, the final scenes of the film. There was Santa lost his. I was going to say he lost his mojo there, but he certainly there was no Christmas spirit left, and he was stuck in New York Central Park. Um, and Zoe Deschanel managed to kind of get all the the punters, the the park goers. Lack of a better word to start singing in the choir. What was your, what was your um, take on that kind of final scene then in the park? 
was that because for me I felt it was too long. I felt that the it just took a while for them to. I felt like Zoe Deschanel was singing for ages, and it could have been done a lot quicker. Now I understand as well that the point was to because the, the sleigh it lost its engine and then put the engine back on and they tried to get it to fly away again. But I just felt it was dragged out that scene. I don't know what you guys thought, Colin. No, I disagree. Um, I really like that scene. I think it's a great finale to the film. I think the whole film, to be honest, is well-paced. I don't personally feel that there's any bits that really drag and I'm a good, uh, I'm a big fan of a wee sing-along, so I quite enjoyed singing along to it too. I mean, I didn't say I didn't like the scene. I mean, I'm just saying it, it's just, no. I don't. I just. I. I don't think it was too long, personally. Okay. To answer your your question, that's we all have opinions. It would be boring if we all had the same opinion. So, I I, I can see your point where it could be a little bit longer, and I think if the movie in general was longer, that that scene could feel longer. If that makes sense, like at yes. some point you're waiting for the movie to end. So if the scene was more than the 90 minutes or whatever it was that that the original airtime was, I, I could see that argument just because there's a lot that's happening in the final, I don't know, 10 minutes of the film. You have everything going on with Santa and then you have the Central Park Rangers and then you have the Christmas spirit meter not filling up and you have the, you know, Buddy trying to fix everything and you have uh, Buddy's brother, re- you know, going and influencing the the uh, the newscaster and you, you just had quite a bit going on that it felt busy. Um, and I think because it felt busy, it probably didn't feel long to me, but again, I could see your point depending on if you were just kind of ready to have the movie end. Like if you're ready to have the movie end, then yeah, I can see that that singing scene could be a little longer, yeah. but for me, I thought it was, I thought it was the perfect length of time. I didn't have any problem with it. I, I thought that the, the finals, they, they wrapped everything up and it didn't feel rushed, which I appreciate because when, when movies rush things to finish it, I, I almost feel scapegoated a little bit that, you know, here I am to watch this and you kind of rip that from me. But overall, I, I think that the movie did a good job ending it. Yeah, it's interesting. I think maybe I'm kind of reliving when I first watched it and things that, I was, like I said, I wasn't too keen on it initially. And I think when I watched it, it was like, is this still happening? Is this still on? And I probably probably did want the film to end at the time. So maybe I do see both your points though. Um I'm not like you, Colin, though. I don't particularly sing along to these things, but um, so what was the timeline on that? Like when did you like when how recently did you change your opinion on the film? Well, I say like I say, so I've I've seen it a handful of times, man. So I'm thinking maybe in the last year or so. I understand why you thought it was maybe overrated. Like people do talk about it a lot, but I think like we said, people talk about it a lot. It's very mainstream, but it's still excellent. So um I mean it's not it, my favourite. It, it, it's not my favourite either. It actually kind of reminds me of, of my favourite, which is the, the Santa Claus with Tim Allen, which has always been like my childhood favourite. Because that was all about a lot about people losing faith and um, having to like recreate that Christmas spirit. So it had that kind of same theme. Yeah. What's your favorite Christmas film, Brian? You know, I I recently asked somebody this with the hopes that they would kind of influence me, but I I don't know that I can pick a top one. Um, Elf is up there. Elf would probably be my top five. With Bleach Bros, we did a ranking, and I did that with the discretion of this can change year over year. Um, but I think that there's just, I'll give you top three. Um, I think I would put elf in top three. Um, I think I would put, uh, the Santa Claus in top three. And yes. then I think I would put the family man in top three. Cause the family man is with Nicholas cage. I think it's Nicholas cage's best film. Um, but I'll tell you what, a, what an honorable mention for me is, and I had a lot of fun with this movie. I just don't know if you consider it a movie. It was a special presentation on Disney Plus, and it was the Guardians of the Galaxy yeah. Christmas special. I, I had a lot that. of fun with that one. We did a review on that as well, just saying. I wasn't too keen on it, to be fair. I love um, the, the music, Brian. But the... I, oh, yeah. yeah. I'll go with my phone. 
So top three would be like the Santa Claus is up there. Nice. Um, do I say Home Alone? Oh, that's a good one. Home Alone. And uh, then Jingle All the Way would be probably top. Oh, yes. Jingle All the Way. See, I don't like Jingle All the Way. Oh, I've never liked you. Jingle All the Way. No. I, I will. Turbo time. I will be a screw. Put the cookie down. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like the Grinch. I've never liked the Grinch personally. Oh. I like the animated Grinch better than Jim Carrey's The Grinch. I think Jim Carrey overacted that one. And it was the very Grinch. much over the top. Sorry, Brian, you were saying why you didn't like Jingle Away. I'm interested to hear your thoughts on that. I just, it, I never got into it. it. There's no one reason that I can point to. I just never got into it. I think it was, you know, I remember that I had some friends watch it when it first came out and they swore by it and they loved it. And maybe I was too much into, into Home Alone at the time or, you know, Babes in Toyland or some different films like that. But yeah, I just never really got into it. It was never, and, and Arnold Schwarzenegger, I never really liked his comedic roles. I liked him in um, Kindergarten Cop. I thought that was good. Yeah. Um, I liked him in Last Action Hero. Um, and I liked him in True Lies, which I would put all of those kind of in the comedy thing. But anything anything above that, I just I felt like, like with Jim Carrey, I feel like Arnold Schwarzenegger just overacts. And I think it's his way of saying, oh, don't look at my muscles, look at my acting chops. And, you know, it, it, uh, it's just not... I just don't think of him as an excellent actor. I think he's great. I just don't think he's excellent. That's fair. Fair, fair enough. You, um, you have mentioned... Nicholas... Sorry, Nicholas. James, you go. I was just saying, they mentioned Nicolas Cage, his favourite, his best film. Well, his opinion, his best film. We did a review with What's the Script um, this week on the film The Rock. Mm, um, I like that one. Yeah, so it's a great movie. So we did a collaboration with What's the Script. So I don't know if you follow them or not on Twitter and YouTube and whatever. But um I, so you can check us out in that and check out the the impressions of Sean Connery and whatnot on that. So <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I'll check it out. Um call me you want to say something though? Yeah just you mentioned like my top three would probably be the Santa Claus um elf and what was the other one? Jingle all the way probably but I wanted to give just a couple of wee shout outs to particularly with something we're reviewing next week. Not very loved across the world, but I've always loved Home Alone 3 just because of the age I was when it came out. And it was a big part of my childhood. But I also love uh, Jack Frost with Michael mm. Keaton. And another, I, I, I really loved the animated uh, Arthur Christmas. I don't know if you've seen that. Yeah, I've seen, it. I've seen that one. There, you said Jack Frost, which which reminded me. There's another one that I think I'd, I'd have to put in my top three, and I don't know which one I'd take off. So don't hold my feet to the fire on that one. <laughs> have you seen Rise of the Guardians? It's an animated film. No. Yeah. So Rise of the Guardians is basically following Jack Frost, um, but Jack Frost ends up creating so much mayhem that it involves Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, the Tooth Fairy. Um, and all of these things. And the nemesis in that film is actually the Sandman. So it, he starts creating all of these bad dreams for kids. And in order for kids to get away from the bad dreams, they have to start believing in these fictional characters again. It's it's definitely worth a watch. You, you guys will like that one. Okay. Give it a is it, is, it, is it streaming anywhere? I don't know. Um, I'll, uh, you might have to take a look after the fact, uh, mm -hmm. after we get off of here. But um, I have it on DVD or Blu-ray, I guess. Um, so I don't know if it's streaming. Cool. Well, I'm going to try and wrap up here, I think. But, um, I wanted to put one more scene. Um, it's the bit where Buddy gets drunk in the mailroom and he's dancing. Is it on a table he's dancing? Yeah. It's like, whoop, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> his dad picks the phone up and it's like, things aren't going so well. <laughs> so that was a good scene. I liked that. Right. There was two. There was two other bits I quickly loved. It was the bit when he's in the revolving door. Yeah, and the one where he's on. And I, every time I go on an escalator, I think of this scene when he's just like pure straddling it on the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Those are good. Those are good for sure. I think uh, 
probably one of the ones that I just really enjoy is is every time he's got the etch a sketch. I, I just you know as kids we all wanted to have some sort of etch a sketch skill, right? So, but it, it's perfect for him. And then also when when he made what was it ninety eight or nine hundred and eighty um, etch a sketches, and it was like not even close to the required amount. But you think about some human making that many etch a sketches by hand, and that's phenomenal right like all of us are like wow that's a whole ton and then all of a sudden it's like well elves are need to make nine thousand of them it's like well yeah no we can't do that <laughs> i think i think yeah, it was 85 he made and he was 915 short or something like that yeah one. yeah yeah that's what so it's like and he just says oh he made oh he made 85 now he's, when he says 85 i'm like that's pretty good going well done buddy and then they all look in shock as if only 85 and he's like they're 115 short of the quota. Yeah. That's quite funny. Exactly. Did you notice uh, Bob the Builder and Mr. Potato Head in that scene? I did notice Mr. Potato Head. I didn't notice Bob the Builder. No, I, I know Potato like, Head, isn't it? Is it the first? Is it the first toy you see? No. Oh. Wow. Interesting. Okay, well, we'll start to wrap up then, folks. So, um, this is the, the part where we give our seismic stars and we rate the film out of 10. Now, Brian, you are the guest, so you get to go first. I'm going to go with uh, nine stars out of 10. I think for what it is, it's a fantastic film. I think it's one of the best Christmas films ever. I think that it deserves all the hype that it gets from everybody. I can see where people don't like it because it is overhyped, but I think it deserves the hype that it gets. So I'm going to go with nine out of 10 seismic stars. Thank you. High praise. Colin? As you know, we always rate these just on, we're not comparing it to every other film out there. So on its own merits, I'm going ten. I just, <laughs> it's just a blast. It's just, it's just a blast from start to finish, and there's not like a part of it I don't enjoy. So, I'm going ten. No, no, I'm quite right, man. Quite right because if it's, a, if it's a film that you you enjoy from start to finish, and it's funny and things, then why would you not give it a ten? So, fair enough, man. That's uh, I can't argue with that. I'm going to give it a eight point five. Uh, you should change your name from Buddy the Rifter to Ebenezer Scrooge. <laughs> <laughs> um, eight point. Well, I, no, I go. I go to nine then. Right, I go. There nine. we go. I go there we nine. go. Don't give in to peer pressure. <laughs> no, no, it's it's Christmas, and it's like you need to give give love to all. It's, I'll give now. Okay, nine out of ten. Um, like I say, it's, the film's grown on me a lot. Um, Still, one bit that irks me probably is that scene at the end. If I'm not, I can't lie about that. But I think um, the characters are excellent in it. Buddy's funny. I don't think there's a word that comes out of his mouth that's not funny. Um, even when he's you know, in a monologuing with the H sketch, it's just it's brilliant. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna give it a nine out of ten. Okay, so that's a uh, quite happy with that then, folks. I uh, those. No scores. Yep. Yeah. I'm happy with it. Okay, so we're going to round up then, folks. So, um, Brian, I don't know if you want to give a wee shout out again to your, about your podcast and where you can find you and things. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my podcast is called Unfiltered Discussions Podcast. I have a website. It's unfilteredDiscussionsPodcast.com. You can follow me on social media at unfiltereddis. Um, I... All episodes release on Mondays. I'm currently in the middle of the second season. Once the second season wraps, I'll take a little bit of a break and then start season three again. Um, but it should be a weekly podcast uh, minus six weeks out of the year. So that's where we're at. Excellent. And if you're listening or watching this podcast, make sure you do check out Brian's podcast, guys, because I'm definitely going to um, check it out. So, yeah, look forward to that. Um, we are Seismic Cinema. Um, we can, you can find us on YouTube, Twitter, Threads, and all the rest of that social media malarkey. Um, we next week we are going to do our second holiday review on Home Alone Three, which I think Colin, you're right, it doesn't get the recognition it deserves. Me, I, I, I for once agree with you. Lots of people uh, hate it, like actually hate it. I'm like. Well, Colin from his script, Mr. Tukey on it last night. No, sorry, Craig from his script, Mr. Um, Tukey on it last night. And there he was, so um, I think he was shocked at the fact that we were going to do it. But you I know think what? It's a, I think it depends when you saw it. I saw it when I was like that kid's age, the actor's age at the time, you know what I mean? 
Defo, definitely. Um, I'm with you, mate, 100%. So that's the next episode. That will be released two weeks from now. Yes. So check us out. Um, you can also check us out in the last episode we've done, we, which is Seismic Soccer. So, Brian, I don't know if you know this or not, but we are massive soccer fans. You, you would call it football, we call it here. And we talk nonsense about anything relative to the world of football Scotland England world football and we have we challenges and things so it's quite it's quite good crack as well we good banter good kind of chats and discussions that surround all that sort of stuff so please check us out on that regard as well tell your friends about us like share help the podcast grow okay that's us guys it was great so, to meet you, Brian. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, nice to finally meet you guys. Of course, I'm a fan of your guys' podcast here. Uh, you know, between Colin and Paul's, who, who I've normally talked to, but James, pleasure to meet you. Uh, I, I know you're going by Buddy the Rifter, but and the Ebenezer Scrooge thing was a joke. So you're, you're not very Scrooge-like. You're, it'd, be, um, you know, it'd be great to have you on again next year for yeah another, another re-episode. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love what you guys do, and I can't wait. Yeah, thanks for coming on, man. Cheerio. Video.